agenda. Give me one sec. Okay, it's 5.15. I'll go ahead and call the December 15th Budget Advisory Committee meeting to order. We'll start with some roll. Chelsea Newtonkamp, present. Suzanne Dirksen, present. Joel Moore, present. Stephen Ward, present. Great. Members of Council? Rita Russell, Council Member at Large, present. And staff. Jenny Nolan, Budget Administrator, present. Maria Sabata, Director of Finance, present. Uh, Brad Power, Director of the Community Development Department, present. Wonderful. And do I have a motion to approve our committee meeting minutes from November 17th? I move to approve the minutes from November 17th. Seconded? Anyone? I will second that. Wonderful. Uh, any opposed? Great. Those minutes are approved. We will move on to new business. We have the community development uh, department presenting to us tonight, Brad Power. We're very much looking forward to hearing about your department and your budget for next year. So I will pass the floor to you, sir. Can everybody see? Yes. Okay. Well, good evening. Thanks for uh, having me this evening. And I appreciate the opportunity to talk about uh, our work that we do in the in the community development department. I think I was last with you uh, in February, so some of this uh, may be a little bit repetitious in terms of what we do, and I'll move through that pretty quickly. And I will say at the outset as well that if you have any questions as we go, uh, I was indicated that we could keep this pretty informal. So if you have any questions or comments or anything else, uh, feel free to interrupt me and we'll just uh, handle that as we go along. Let me see. I'm not advancing. Whoops, sorry about that. So a little bit about the Community Development Department. I think I shared this last time. The way I would characterize what we do in five seconds or less is we facilitate the phys physical development of Englewood and we do that through several divisions. Uh, planning, includes development reviews. So that's all the development applications in Englewood, and that can range from a backyard fence to a major office building like the Synergy Medical Building that's going up and almost finished across the street from Swedish Hospital, for example. We have a long range planning person who's specifically dedicated to maintaining the elements of our comprehensive plan, our regional planning relationships with entities such as RTD and the Denver Regional Council of Governments and also various area plans that we work on throughout the, uh, the years and times as well. We have two housing programs. E3 stands for Energy Efficiency Englewood, which we dedicate our allocation of federal community development block grant funds every year <clears throat> to a, assisting approximately 12 Englewood homeowners who are income qualified to provide uh, repair opportunities and energy, actually energy efficiency opportunities for their homes. So that could be new windows, uh, weather stripping, insulation, water heaters, that type of thing. We are just finishing our first year of our home repair program, which was an allocation of $100,000 from the city's former housing fund. And again, we are doing that on an income qualified basis for residents who have home repair issues. So that could be um, sidewalks, uh, again, things like, um, uh, let's see, steps to make things Americans for Disabilities Act compliant and accessible and those types of things that are repair needs for uh, folks who go just beyond the, uh, the energy uh, realm. We're also the group in the city that manages the Englewood trolley contract. So we provide uh, the services pr is provided by a third party, um, MV Transportation, and we also have a partnership with RTD who provides funding uh, as well. Building services, once everything is approved in terms of the planning reviews, 
uh, building services issues all the building permits in the community. They do all the inspections of the construction. They issue certificates of occupation at the end of construction to make sure that our building environment is safe and secure uh, going forward. We also do contractor licensing in Englewood. Every contractor that does work in our community needs to be licensed in the community. Um, economic development, our entire program, uh, when I arrived almost five years ago, uh, we did a pretty comprehensive look at uh, where we were with our, with our economic development program, and we decided the bread and butter and the heart of what makes this community tick business-wise is our small, our small business base. And so we revamped all of our um, development program, especially our grants and our training opportunities for businesses to really focus on small business and entrepreneurial uh, development. Englewood's built out, as you know, there's virtually no vacant land here. So we also have redevelopment. So we're working with private property owners to see if they're in the position of accelerating their time frame or any have any time frame for looking at uh, the eventual re redevelopment replacement of older aging uses uh, with new investment in the community. So I'll just briefly go through our work plan objectives for 2020 and a little bit of an update on where each, each are. Uh, interim Title 16 updates. This is our development code, so it includes zoning and all of our dimensional standards that, that um, guide uh, development in the community. And there were two uh, revisions that were done on an interim basis this year including the uh, council's adoption of ordinances related to permitting short-term rentals in certain parts of the community and, and accessory dwelling units as well. Those were both completed earlier this year. On a larger scale, we're taking a look for the first time in almost a generation at uh, the Title 16 in its, its entirety. And the idea is in 2021, we'll embark on a comprehensive rewrite of that entire document uh, to make it more cogent um, understandable from folks in, in terms of our applicants, but also there's been a lot of change in the 16 years in terms of how things are built and development standards and that type of thing. So we thought it would be important to take kind of that generational change opportunity, uh, given a lot of the growth in the community in the last five years, particularly. So it was an opportune time to look at the code in its, in its total. So we've actually spent the last few months doing a community engagement process around that. Uh, where we've had to adjust to the COVID environment, uh, but still nevertheless trying to engage with the community through workshops, surveys, uh, polls, those types of things to get some uh, community feedback of what should change and what should be think, thought about in terms of incorporation into the new code. We're going to be compiling that um, probably through January, and we'll go back to the City Council early next year with a comprehensive report on what we heard from the community as a springboard uh, to hopefully embark on that larger project that I talked about. Uh, we, I, I mentioned we do have the short-term regulations and, and ordinance in place, so that was completed. There was a project called Downtown Matters that looked at the entire central area of the city in terms of the next generation or beyond, and that included the city center. It included a look at the downtown area, which also uh, incorporated a downtown development authority formation election that was successfully uh, accomplished in the general election. Uh, on in uh, last month, so the DDA is going forward. We actually had a conversation with the city council last night about next steps for that. And then we're also looking at uh, future uses of the light rail corridor as it could change over time um, in and between the in and around in between the two stations uh, in Englewood. Two years ago, we started what we thought was pretty innovative. Uh, we uh, what we thought was a pretty innovative thing is a citizens planning school, which would be 15 or 20 people coming together. We do that twice a year um, to just have some discussions around how planning and development works in the community, um, just to have the opportunity for citizens who are interested to learn a little bit more about how that works. Uh, we did one session in our spring program in March, and I remember that night because we handed out little bottles of sanitizer and people were kind of um, kind of joking about that. And then the very next week, the world stopped and we had to suspend the planning school, but we hope, hope to pick it up. Uh, in 2021. Um, I just want to make sure people are hearing me, right? We're good? Yes. Okay, great. Um, the permitting software replacement, we've uh, invested uh, thanks to council's action and approval. We're working with a company to uh, replace our software for all of our development permitting and our planning permitting and including 
Um, we're going to get to the point where we'll have online payment capabilities. So our customers will be able to do uh, a lot more remotely um, than they have in the past. We've obviously shifted a lot of that this, this year, um, given the COVID environment, but it's really not optimal in terms of uh, efficiency. So we're uh, in the midst right now of working with our vendor to replace that soft software. City Center Redevelopment, we, we uh, selected a master developer partner uh, earlier this year. We're continuing to work with that group out of Portland, Oregon, to try to position City Center for uh, its redevelopment, which unlike 20 years ago when City Center was open kind of all at once, uh, the future City Center redevelopment will likely happen um, over a period of time, but we want to make sure that we have a good master plan and development relationship in place for that to be successful. Uh, last month, uh, or maybe it was October, the City Council adopted the new building codes, which happened probably every three to four years on a cycle. Uh, so we brought those for, for their adoption. 2020 census obviously happened this year, very much compromised by COVID in terms of the outreach that we had planned. Uh, but nevertheless, I do believe that um, Arapahoe County finished slightly higher in the response rate, I believe, this time than uh, 2010. Uh, I mentioned the Home Repair and Improvement Program got off to a great start this year. We've uh, been able to help 11 um, homeowners so far with that one. And then our Economic Development Program and Partnerships, we've continued to um, do the outreach and the marketing efforts that we're doing in the community and working with our businesses. Can someone tell me what's not on this, this list that probably was big this year? COVID. So the one thing that happened um, to all of us in March was the impacts of COVID. And one of the things that we did, particularly in our economic development plan program, is we immediately shifted to helping our small businesses. And you may have heard um, and seen some of this in the community, but we initially created city funded out of our economic development program um, funds and grants to just help people, help businesses. Uh, and to try to stay afloat that first three months that were very intense and a lot of closures. And so we did that very early. We're one of the, if not the first, we were one of the very first in the state uh, to put funds in folks' hands, business people's hands in Englewood to help them survive those critical early months of the COVID um, um, pandemic. Soon after that, we were fortunate that we were able to tap into the CARES Act funding of which uh, City of Englewood has received an allocation of $3.2 million through Arapahoe County. And we've used that for what are now a total of seven different grant programs um, since March. And they've ranged from that initial grant to nonprofit grants, home-based business grants. We've, uh, with the, the restaurant dilemma that folks are in right now, we've pivoted to providing some uh, closure grants specifically for restaurants, bars, and gyms under the level red designation, uh, outdoor heaters. We've done some outdoor seating grants. And as of uh, last week, we uh, have a third party delivery fee uh, rebate of up to 50% of their rebate of their third party delivery charge. So that would be like a restaurant who uses DoorDash or Grubhub, that type of service. They can get a refund of the fees for the time at which they were closed in March, April and May, and since November 20th of this year. So. I can fairly say that we didn't, obviously none of us expected that, the impact from the COVID-19 um, experience, but I'm really, really proud of the work that we did in our department, but there are probably half a dozen departments and divisions of the city, probably 20 staff members um, throughout the city, that even though uh, my team and our department led the effort, we had tremendous help from a lot of people, and I really, really wanna pay great tribute uh, to the finance department. Um, Maria and her staff have just been exemplary in helping this, all of our plans and our projects and our grants uh, related to COVID recovery uh, succeed as they have. I think it's a real testament uh, to the, to the um, strength of this organization and the resilience of our small business community that we've done over 300 grants and we're closing in on about $900,000 in funding. In terms of our 2021 initiatives that you were uh, curious about, the Title 16, that's gonna involve a lot of lawyer time um, on an outside basis. It's a very technical document when you reduce it to its elements. And so uh, we have that in the adopted budget for next year. Uh, professional services, downtown matters, city center redevelopment. Again, we're gonna be relying on some specialized outside counsel 
for attorney's fees and also for real estate analysis and financial analysis as we go along uh, because it's a very complex uh, real estate site uh, that city center is. So we need that type of assistance. Uh, we increased our share of the Englewood trolley funding from $85,000 to $100,000 this year. Uh, unfortunately, given RTD situation monetarily and fiscally, their budget was reduced uh, a bit in terms of the trolley. So what we're doing in terms of uh, responding to that is we've narrowed the time for termination of the agreement with our third party provider from I think 90 days to 60 days which would give us the ability to operate well into next year probably even into the fall with the budget that we have but if we discover maybe in the summer or early fall that we're going to have an issue and and uh, first thing we would do is to go to the city council to try to uh, have a discussion about appropriating additional funds to make it through the rest of the year uh, RTD may come back uh, with additional funds depending on their stage of recovery. We may outreach in the community in terms of trying to find some some corporate dollars to assist the uh, the trolley. But we, we feel quite comfortable that the trolley can be operated at its current level in its current headways in terms of 15 to 20 minutes um, throughout all of next year. But we do have the ability to return to council and work with our um, provider on a shorter term basis than we had. And then finally, short-term short -term rental monitoring was a modest increase in the contract for our third-party provider who monitors um, those contracts. The risk of, uh, risk of reduction in budgetarily constrained programs, the first one and the obvious one is the Federal CARES Act funding um, expires in two weeks. So that money is going away. And so we're going to have a bit of a pause um, for one of two things. Uh, council could direct us to continue to provide some of these grant programs through city funding that would obviously have to be identified, or if the federal government does an extension of the CARES Act or something very similar to it, uh, that we could continue to support the businesses uh, through uh, that, that federal support, which has been um, obviously very, very helpful so far uh, in our response. We kind of have an annual uncertainty over the amount of community development block grant funding that will get allocated to the, the, the county for our housing rehabilitation program. It's generally held steady the last few years, but we just never know uh, until you know we, we kind of get the number. But we've been able to help 10 to 12 families um, on an annual basis. And we've actually reduced our, our waiting list slightly. Our, our waiting list used to be a little bit over a year. Uh, it's a little bit less than a year now, but we still have folks on the waiting list. So <clears throat> I don't think community development block grants will go away, but the perpetual discussion is, is how much will, be, will we be allocated based on that federal program. Uh, we also anticipate the, the, the opportunity that maybe our regular development, economic development grant programs may be in more demand in the post-recovery environment. And we have two programs. One is a business startup grant, and a business expansion grant. And so if there are new businesses that are coming back or ones that want to expand, if they have that capability in a post-code or recovery, um, I can anticipate that there might be more demand uh, for our regular economic development uh, grant program once we're able to shift back to that um, much needed attention. And then uh, we need multiple funding sources for complex projects such as city center redevelopment. And we're gonna try to get creative in ways to look at um, you know, trying to get as much from our partners as we can in terms of cost sharing. And uh, we've worked through the Englewood Environmental Foundation for some of our legal costs as well. And I, I'm assuming that we'll, con um, we'll continue to do that going forward. And then last, I talked about the long-term Englewood trolley um, funding, uh, given the constraints that are ongoing. If we had a 10% increase in the budget, uh, we would try to uh, supplement our federal funding with with uh, local funding to reduce that backlog in our Englewood environmental uh, Englewood efficiency program. And so we would just try to leverage that maybe with a little bit more dollars. Uh, we try to stabilize obviously the funding for the Englewood trolley. Uh, zoning enforcement, so um, property issues, fence issues, trees issues, um, those types of things uh, that, that are kind of neighbor to neighbor are increasing in terms of volume. And so we proposed a half-time enforcement position uh, in the last budget. It wasn't uh, approved, but we would probably take a look at that again 
at some point in the future if budgets were uh, in a position to uh, include additional FTE. Uh, obviously, we know and understand that that's a pretty narrow proposition um, right now, given the, the economic climate. Uh, paper performance for our department employees. I'm a big person. I'm, I'm big on um, being able to uh, reward folks for exemplary work uh, versus uh, raises across the board. <clears throat> so if we had some type of recognition pool where we were able to do that, obviously it'd be quite modest. Uh, but I've had uh, employees in my group this year that have gone far beyond uh, their job expectations. And so uh, having some type of ability to help uh, that type of recognition, uh, I think what I would I would throw in as well if we had that that type of discretionary um, funding. And then finally, the great unknown is is our ongoing level of what we'll need and what we'll have uh, going forward in well into 2021 uh, in terms of our our business support for the COVID recovery. I mean, it's terrific to see the news coverage of everybody getting needles stuck in their arms around the country, um, but we know that that's going to be a longer process than we all want. And so our businesses are going to need our support uh, well into next year. And we're just going to continually have to be creative uh, in looking at both what we can, how we can do it, and how we can fund it. Lastly, I'll just conclude and just recognize the 17 folks who are in this department who have all stepped up this year in a most unique year that nobody ever expected. And every single one, every single person on this list had to adjust their job uh, tremendously. And a lot of these people are very public, public facing. And we've completely reinvented how we do our business. And yet we did it successfully. And I'm really proud of these folks. And I'm proud of the work that we did this year. So that's it. And that's all I have for now. OK, Brad, I think uh, Steve has his hand up. He'd like to ask a question. OK, I, somehow I need to get back the uh, the meeting and there I am. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, so the question I have is how zoning enforcement differs from code enforcement. They seem like they kind of walk hand in hand. They do, actually. That's a great question. We work very closely with code. Code is more about physical conditions on the site on sites so like weeds and trash and you know dogs and cars and all of that we're more about what makes the sites unique so there's things like trees and fences and um, uh, physical conditions like deteriorating structures and that type of thing and that's kind of more in our realm versus kind of the, the the visible things that are that are quite obvious but we work with code quite closely and coordinate on, our, on a lot of our cases because it's inevitable that if code enforcement is involved in one aspect of a property, it tends to have um, other issues that we would delve into as well. So who performs the compliance function now for the department? Is that done in cooperation with code enforcement or is there an inspector or something that does that currently? Yeah, we we um, we have our planning team that are obviously familiar with our codes, so it depends on um, who's available, um, who has the ability to um to to do it in terms of the work schedule but we're also pretty familiar with that team is pretty familiar with parts of the city they've dealt with these areas before um so they tend to kind of go out in in the areas that they know well um, but it's our planning team that does all the zoning inspections thank you sure steve it's good to see you by the way it's been a while i have a question um thank you so much first of all for being here I'm a graduate of the Citizen Planning School. I found that incredibly useful and really appreciate you guys putting that on. Um, and I think also we may have crossed paths at the Inglewood Christmas store last weekend. So I know your department was really involved in that. And I thought that was- Oh, were you in the parking lot? Yep, I was- I uh, That's great, yeah. That was a fun <laughs> evening. That was a lot of fun, despite the icy parking lot. I know, the weather didn't cooperate, but it was great <laughs> to see so many city employees there. Um, but I just hearing about all of the granting and everything you guys have done for business and being so quick to respond, I just appreciate it so much. Um, and I'm wondering if you can add a little bit more color. You know, you said you 300 grants. Do you have any kind of data about are those businesses all still open? Um, and how has that been impactful in the community? Love to hear sure. more. Uh, well, we haven't done a census, but my 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 thinking is is most of them are open, but it's hard to tell with some of them mm -hmm. because a lot of them are servicing their customers either remotely. Restaurants, obviously, they're all over the map. Some of them who can 
who can adapt to takeout, they've done that. But a place like One Barrel um, downtown, they're not doing takeout. They're just not set up for that. So that's why we've tried to do the variety of grants that we have done. Um, a lot of them have been, you know, if you meet these criteria in terms of you've either laid off people or you're not getting landlord support or you have um, PPE expenses or you have to um, clean more often. If they've met these criteria that are in our application, um, a lot of them have gotten cash support and they're doing that to pay insurance. They're doing that to pay employees. A lot of them are doing it to pay rent. Um, we've had terrific landlords, uh, commercial landlords in the community that have worked with their with their tenants. Others have not. And they've not, you know, the landlords have said themselves that they haven't been in the position. They have bills, too. So a lot of our grants have just been, you know, cash. But then we've gone into these specialized grants for the furniture earlier in the year. And the outdoor heaters is a great example now of those types of physical things that we've done um, to try to help some of the businesses um, get over the hump. But understand that none of them have gotten our our grants and said everything's great now. They're still really um, trying to to survive and do the best we can and we're doing the best we can we can try to help them with the resources we need i'm really hopeful that, that the federal government I'm, I'm trying to put politics aside here but looking at the leverage that we've had from those federal dollars not just in the programs that i'm doing but other things across the city that 3.2 million dollars has been a godsend um, to this and other communities and so i'm hopeful that <clears throat> when things change in january if not beforehand, that we'll get some type of uh, part two, whatever it may be, because that's really where the leverage is and, and the impact can be. Question from Council Member Russell. <clears throat> Thank you. Actually, I would just like to make a comment about that a little bit because I happen to be liaison to the ACE uh, <clears throat> committee and they have done um, a lot in reaching out to the businesses and uh, <clears throat> just uh, last week they were talking about the COVID-19 impact and I will tell you all of the businesses that were contacted by ACE were very grateful for the help that the city of Englewood has given them and there was one business owner that has businesses in five different cities said the only city that did anything for them was the city of Englewood. So um, our community development department is doing a great job and it is greatly appreciated. Council member Russell, I didn't have a chance to say this last night, but thank you. Cause I know you said that last night at the council meeting and we really appreciate it. It's It's been a challenging year, but we've learned a lot and um, it's been very, very re rewarding for those of us who do it day in and day out. So I appreciate your comments. Well, thank you for all the hard work. We appreciate it. <clears throat> uh -oh. Any other questions from the committee? I'll chime in. Um, do we do we know how trolley ridership is measured? Yeah, we have monthly statistics. Uh, so all of the drivers um, have a counter and they they count every person who boards the trolley uh, daily and we report the month we report the uh, the ridership monthly to the city council thanks yeah and i and a comment i was at the citizens planning school meeting in march with the hand sanitizer and yeah. i'm sad that we did not get to continue i look forward to participating in 2021 if and when it happens Suzanne, we haven't forgotten about anybody. We'll definitely be in <laughs> touch with everybody who made it to that first meeting. And we have uh, more interesting hands on things planned in this go round than we did the first. We learned a lot from the first one, but yeah. we want to make it far more interactive and we just can't do that in this format. Yeah, so, no, understand. Yeah, we'll definitely be in touch. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. <laughs> I know one of the initiatives that I know this committee is interested in and um, excited about is the Downtown Matters piece um, and some of that redevelopment. Do you anticipate any um, of that being affected meaningfully around by COVID and this year, or do you anticipate that moving forward as planned? Well, the, the, the big next step for the downtown area specifically is what I mentioned during my comments, which is the Downtown Development Authority. Mm -hmm. 
So that will uh, go forward because um, we got authorization. There was a positive authorization vote from the air from the folks within the proposed district, which more or less stretches from the Angwa train station, the light rail station on the west through the east side of the hospital district and about four or five blocks north and south or about two or three blocks north and south. And uh, in terms of the DDA, as I mentioned, we went to the city council last night and had a discussion about taking the next steps. So the immediate next step is going to be to recruit the, the members of that board. Uh, there'll be seven board members, all from the district, six of which six of which will be from the district, and there'll be one city council member representative um, on the downtown development authority. And then after that, they're going to start to look to um, opportunities to start to actually um, do their work. One of the things that we had to do to formulate the downtown development authority was to do what's known, known as a downtown um, plan of, of investment or action. And so we did a new plan for the downtown over the course of the summer and the city city council reviewed that in July and endorsed it. And that has an 18 month COVID recovery specialty plan within it. And so I think one of the things that the DDA will do is once they get formed, they'll obviously have to think about ways to <clears throat> raise money. And so there's going to be grant opportunities. We're going to come back to the city council to talk about um, the possibility of some city initiatives, initial start, startup grant funding. And then longer term, there's a much longer and more complicated discussion around the DDA's long term financing. The DDA questions were four in total in terms of what was asked in November. And the first question was, should we form it? And that was answered in the affirmative. The second question was, if, if it's formed, the downtown development authorities can do what's known as um, tax increment financing. So they can they can um, retain the taxes that are generated by new development and new investment in these areas, and that can leverage into additional investments in the future. And so it's not a new tax, but it's a way to allocate um, the new taxes. Now that's very complicated, it's very difficult to do, and it's clear that we have some work to do with both the school district and the county to talk and the city and the DDA to talk about how is that pie if it's divided up at all in the future how would we divide it up and so that's all still to come in terms of the first year or two of the, of the authority's existence we'll be talking about how to do that and how to allocate those various dollars and how they would be spent so the authority needs to develop a work plan around that as well the third question was well if you can allocate that that tax increment do you want to try to bond against it over time and so there was a bond question, and this, these are all Tabor questions, by the way, they're required by state law. These, the council settled on a pretty extensive number of up to $80 million over the course of 30 years in terms of that investment ability, and that did not pass. So that's kind of in, in the shopping basket for some point in the future uh, to possibly go back to the voters uh, that council would authorize that at some point in the future down the road indeterminate at this point. And then the fourth question, which didn't pass, was a separate question around a two mil levy property tax to fund the DDA's um, operations specifically, and neither did that pass. So we have the DDA in place. The council wants to go forward with forming the board, but we have a lot of work to do around what their initial work plan is. That downtown plan will help a lot. And then the discussions around how do we how do we come to some type of agreements to come together from probably various sources around its initial funding for maybe its first three years until it gets um, its legs underneath it. And there's the possibility of going back to the voters at some point in the future. So that was very long winded, but um, that's kind of how the DDA kind of came to existence and kind of an outline of how its first year or so could look. No, I appreciate that. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions? Or comments. Okay. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you so much for your time this evening. Okay. Well, I hope this was helpful. And if anything else comes down the road, feel free to reach out to me. And I wish you best for the rest of the meeting and definitely all the best for the holiday season. Thank you. Thanks you too. Have, you too. Thanks, Brad. Take care. Thanks. Have a great night. All righty. Okay, we will move on to the rest of our business. We've got a few more things to cover this evening.
The next is to review the draft memo um, that came out of last month's meeting around asking council to consider an ordinance to add an alternate member to this committee. Joel, we can bring you up to speed briefly. Um, we just had a, a really thoughtful meeting. I, I appreciated the uh, input from council about changing our ordinance or the ordinance around this committee so that we could have an alternate so that if we have a situation again where we have we lose a member, um, we're not in kind of the issue of not meeting quorum. And then we also don't have to ask council to make kind of an emergency vacancy fill and take their time and, and be respectful of staff, et cetera. So that's what this memo is. It's linked in our agenda. Does anyone have any feedback on this draft? I think it looks good, Chelsea, or whoever <laughs> wrote it. I assume it was Chelsea, but. It was, uh, not, it was Jenny? Jenny? Well, I, <laughs> I, I like it. I think it'll do just fine. Um, if I yeah, I'd like to speak to the the two questions at the bottom of the memo. What duties and responsibilities will alternate members have? Um, for example, will they be able to vote on committee issues? And we talked about this a little bit at our last meeting, and our committee doesn't really have much voting activity or any voting activity. Um, except for, you know, say meeting minutes, approval of minutes. I mean, my primary concern as it's outlined here is just not having a quorum and backfilling a position or making sure we have representation when we have a small committee of four members or less. Um, so I think the question is how to mitigate that risk. Um, Jenny, just as a point of clarification, are those questions we need to answer tonight? We do because um, once Mayor Pro, um, Pro Tem Sierra and or Council Member Russell brings this in, this or request to City Council, City Council will then direct the City Attorney to draft these changes to the ordinance. So we need to be able to communicate to the city attorney what changes we would like. Not only do we want to add alternate members, but whether or not we we're going to those positions will be restricted in in any way, or are they? Do they have the same privileges as a regular member? Um, Does anyone know what other committees do who have alternates? Um, PNC has one, right? PNZ is a little bit different because right. they're a quasi judicial committee, but most um, most alternates vote um, if there's a member absent. But I'm not so sure that it would be a problem really for you to have an alternate that could interact with you, but would not be able to vote unless there was someone missing. I mean, I think typically that is how it works. I, I do know the NPNZ, now that you bring that up, the they did let, and this happened, uh, I think maybe four years ago, finally they got a new member as an alternate, alternate who has been involved a lot in state legislature. And she she told them, you all have to let the alternate you know, voice their opinions because they're a citizen also. So um, <clears throat> I think typically that um, that you should be able to have someone interact with your committee um, if they're there. But as far as voting, they wouldn't vote probably unless somebody was absent. Yeah, maybe this is an issue of semantics. I, I don't think the need is for an alternate member, but someone to backfill a vacancy in a timely manner so um and forgive me if we're just you know circling back to conversations we had last month but um i'll propose this process and i think this was outlined the first time around and let me know if you strongly agree strongly disagree or what have you but 
during the time of the application and interview process on a SAMA annual basis at that time, maybe, you know, if we have a full committee, maybe in addition at that time, a I'll say a backfill position is is assigned to somebody who applied or is open to filling that role. And then if someone were to vacate, if an existing member were to vacate their seat midterm, then that backfill person could then immediately hop in and join um, until the next round of interviews and applications. You know, just one opinion, an alternate would work for that position okay. uh, to do exactly that. So then they could fill in till the next time, the next round. And then at that time you could ask for the alternate to be moved to a regular position. I know that's how the other ones work. That's yeah. Steve, I guess my. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Steve. No, Stephen, go ahead. So <clears throat> I would view an alternate sort of like insurance against not having a quorum. So you don't file an insurance claim until the catastrophe occurs. So we have an alternate, which is kind of like a bench for the committee. And they have the opportunity to listen and learn um, as they serve as an alternate. Uh, but until the time comes for them to make a contribution uh, by being called up uh, to fill a seat that a member either doesn't show on a certain night or um, resigns or what have you, uh, the alternate is essentially sitting and listening. Uh, another analogy would be like an alternate juror. You sit, you watch the trial, but when deliberation starts, you don't go into the jury room until the judge boots one of the other jurors. Your juror analogy makes sense to me. So if we had an alternate member, that person would zoom in with the rest of us and merely listen. And then if I were to abandon my seat, you know, sometime in the next month, they could come in and, and fill my spot and hit the ground running. Is that would be my vision for the position, yes. Okay. Councilmember Russell, does that contradict your point earlier about they have they can be allowed to speak if they're a citizen? Um, I don't think it it violates that. I think the committee just needs to decide what they want to do, and perhaps Mayor Pro Tem has some input on that also. No, so I was just going to say I think the the only difference in the uh, the only difference here with the alternate juror example is that. Suzanne, if you were to not make a meeting next month, if you weren't to make the meeting next month, that alternate would fill your spot then just for that meeting. Um, and then go back to being an alternate when you're back the month, the month after. So just a little bit different. Kind of like a silent member when they are functioning as an alternate. Is that an accurate description? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I guess I'm just trying to understand what the alternate's role is when we're operating at full capacity. Right. And, and actually, that was one of the questions that I had because obviously the next agenda item, uh, Steve, you obviously did a lot of work on that aspect. Would the alternate be able to work with the committee on putting together that type of document? Yeah, I guess that would be one of the questions I have and I don't have an answer for it, but I'm just kind of curious. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, what role would an alternate have in that type of. You know, yeah, or our annual report, like if they. You know, join and listen to every single meeting and they aren't needed to actually fill in a vacant seat. I don't know. It feels almost like a disservice to somebody to not include them in. Um, some of that work that we the tangible work that we output for council just along those lines my question is what what the pool of people who are willing to sit silently through a meeting with no input is uh and it, it, it seems like like you're saying a waste of a person but i i don't know what else to do about it necessarily I think the city attorney could answer those questions also. Even then I have a thought. So in the, in the past, there have been some people that have expressed some concern with the learning curve involved uh, in joining the committee. Uh, there's a lot of content to absorb midstream, um, depending on what part of the cycle the appointment occurs. 
Uh, so from my perspective, uh, an alternate, uh, you know, sort of riding the bench for a season, um, whether that be six months or three weeks or a year, really helps with continuity on the committee and the transfer of knowledge. Mayor Pro Tem. I was going to say just in terms of my experience with with other boards that do have alternates, I, I don't feel that any alternate member has taken it as a slight in a sense or, or, or at least a waste of their time. Um, it would be good to get a little bit more data behind that for, you know, if that is a concern of this of this committee of whether or not it makes sense to have somebody just sit in the background. Uh, but from my experience, I think, if, you know, I think most uh, community members or alternate members uh, just want to serve in any type of capacity. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I don't think it's I don't think it's offensive in itself. I, I think that if somebody would like to serve in that capacity and is able to, that's wonderful. I, I just don't I I don't know <clears throat> the, the pool of people that you guys uh, work with and the you know, asking people to join committees. I don't know what that looked like and things along those lines. Hey, Joel, you were one of them. <laughs> I, I was. <laughs> you went through the process. <laughs> I know, but I was probably the broad bottom of the barrel. So, what's, uh... <laughs> so I have a, a recommendation perhaps and, and feel free to push back if I'm alone in this. I am fine with the alternate, uh, not only listening in, but if they want to ask a question to a presenter um, or we're engaging, I think obviously more, more minds, more people who want to invest in their community is a good thing. Um, I think if they had a thoughtful insight for the report, I would welcome that. Um, and then it really, when it comes down to decision-making, if for example, we needed to take a vote about what was going to go into the report, that would be maybe something that they wouldn't participate in on like official business, or they would, fill in for someone if, in a voting capacity if they were not there. But otherwise, I would be comfortable with them engaging as if they were kind of a, a regular member. Um, so that's my recommendation. And if anyone objects. I'm, I'm willing to see that, Chelsea, uh, mostly just because I have about six months left on this committee till my term limit expires. So this doesn't affect me nearly as much as it affects the other committee members. You have a lot of knowledge to pass on before that and only a slight panic, so. <laughs> I can agree to that, Chelsea. Okay. Great. So, Jenny, does that capture, um, do you have the answers to that? Do you? It, it does, yes. Thank you. And I'll pass it on to the city attorney just to kind of give her a little heads up. But um, I think the next steps will be that we'll send, we'll email this memo to um, Mayor Pro Tem Sierra and Council Member Russell, and when they at their next meeting, they'll be able to bring this up during um, their either their members' choice or when they have um, um, committee meeting um, time. I can't think of what that agenda item is. If I can see it, I, I can't think of what it is. Well. And in, in all fairness, the mayor pro tem sits on the decision making committee, so it's really good for him to have that because he can get it scheduled. Woo, woo, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> um, quick question about the memo. I just want to make sure I'm reading one piece correctly. Looking at the kind of four uh, questions, is number four, is it meant to say if a meeting is scheduled? The council liaison? Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, if, yeah, if you look at right before we start the oh, one, it starts with an if. I see. Sorry. I just. That's okay. If a meeting is scheduled, yes. The. Right. Uh, and I, and I can reword that. I can start all of those with if. Yeah, if it's like. fine. It's fine. I just wanted to make sure I was understanding it correctly. So then when, once the, um, once the, the agenda item gets on the agenda, the uh, mayor will communicate back to Mayor Pro Tem Sierra and or uh, Council Member Russell, and then they'll communicate back to you, um, Chair Nunning uh, Camp, and then we'll be off off and running at that point. Off to the races. Wonderful. Yes. Thank you, Jenny. And thanks thank, everyone for the discussion. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Um, can you remind me, does our new member join in January? Yes. Okay. I don't know who that is. I'm sure we'll get um, information 
um, within the next couple weeks. Great. All right. Perfect. Thanks. Can I correct that? I believe that the appointment doesn't occur until, or they won't join until the February meeting. If I, but we will appoint them in January. Oh, you appoint in January. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Moving on to some substantive discussion. Um, we got a wonderfully put together and very thorough uh, brief from Steve. And I just want to say you put so much work into that. Thank you so much for um, distilling so much information in a very kind of um, understandable way for those of us who needed it understandably. Um, and so I know it came in yesterday evening and so everyone may not be fully uh, well versed in it, myself including, but Steve, I kind of want to just pass this over to you to present um, your thoughts and where we're at in this process and maybe some suggested next steps. Sure, uh, thank you. Uh, so a lot of what went into this and a lot of the reason behind the length was because there were a couple of issues at work as I saw it um, that, that were, that city leadership was kind of struggling with relative to our message. Uh, so there are some philosophical issues that I address, things like uh, what is the purpose of a, a surplus? Um, what is the purpose of city money? Uh, things like that. And then there are some more structural uh, issues that I address, like uh, what do other cities around us do? Uh, what has Inglewood done in the past? And how does that framework fit into what we're suggesting here? So I think uh, I'll probably just start at the end. Uh, the conclusions, there are a couple of uh, bombs that I threw here. <laughs> uh, the first is to reiterate that I believe that it's time to dissolve the long-term asset reserve, uh, something that we as a committee might need to agree on, uh, but I threw that in because I feel strongly about it. Um, the second is that uh, Tabor uh, Reserve, 3% required by uh, the Colorado Constitution, should be excluded from any reserve calculation because that money effectively can never be spent. Um, and uh, the third big conclusion, as I see it, is that the city has for some time employed a sort of a ratcheting and sliding model. And what we would do here, if they were to adopt our recommendation, is just to structure that in a way that fits um, both with what has been done in the past and what those previous indicators show might happen in the future. Um, so, uh, with that having been said, um, I, I feel like the first portion of this report is stronger than the last portion because I, I did sort of hurry through uh, the conclusions in the past part. Um, but the, the I think one of the biggest new factors here is uh, the chart on page, uh, excuse me, five. Um, annual revenue expenses and surplus change in percent. Um, so what I did to to get this data is I analyzed data from all of the comprehensive annual financial reports over the past 20 years. So we have a 20 year window of financial data uh, that has been audited. So that data goes through 2019 right now. Um, <clears throat> and I noticed as I was using just numbers, it, the scale was difficult to capture. Um, so what this chart attempts to do is demonstrate how small changes in uh, the city's um, financial position relative to revenue or expenses percentage wise cause larger swings in uh, the fund balance. Um, but one of the interesting discoveries was that the swings up are just as large as the swings down. So um, there are a couple of points that you can look at on the chart that I've called out and we can trace things that were happening in the economy around us starting you know 2001 to 2002 for instance the dot com bubble burst and then 2009 the housing bubble popped and uh, as a sales tax dependent city or a tax dependent city revenue dropped and councils were left scrambling how do we balance the budget and they took draws from savings. So you see a large percentage swing in savings. But what we got out of that was a continuity of service. And I think another one of the philosophical questions that I might not have captured 
uh, as well as I would have liked is uh, how much money is it okay to spend on an annual basis? When do we have a problem? And I tried to pick a number by setting the baseline at 16.7%, which is two months of revenue, um, and then capping growth beyond that point, as well as saying that when you have start with a large surplus and you're drawing down on that large surplus, you have a problem at the point that you're drawing below that 16.7%. So um, that's sort of a long-winded introduction to, to the general concepts that I was trying to capture, but uh, I'm open to any comments and uh, interested to hear how the committee feels about some of the larger issues like retirement of the long-term asset reserve, for instance. That seems actually like a good place to start. Oh, sorry, Suzanne, why don't you go first? No, go ahead. I, I was going to start with that, but if okay. you have something to say, by all means. <laughs> well, no, I just, you know, the taper piece makes sense to me. Ratchet and slide, we've discussed, but I would love for you to kind of just walk us through your rationale for the long term. So it's more of a case of trying to simplify budgeting. It's also a case of money should have a purpose. And uh, that long term asset reserve has been around. Um, I put the date in there. Uh, I'm, I'm going to say, yeah, it's 2007. So we've had it for 13 years. Mm -hmm. And I'm of the opinion that 13 years is a long time to sit on a golden egg and not find a way to use it for the benefit of the public. Um, so I would like to see the citizens' money uh, deliberately put to use for public benefit, as opposed to sitting around uh, either on principle or because the city's leadership can't find a, a, a way to agree on how to spend it. Um, I wouldn't cry if the long-term asset reserve was used to either acquire a new park or to uh, do much needed refurbishment to our current parks. And I think that I made the argument in this report that that would be a multi-generational benefit, things like capital investments. So even if we just took the long-term asset reserve and swept it into the capital projects fund or capital improvements fund, I think that would be a higher and better use of the money than just sitting in a fund that people don't seem to fully understand that clouds the bottom line on an annual basis. Thank you. Anyone else? Um, I, I'd like to share my two cents about retiring later. Um, I agree with the philosophy of spending this money we have so that it benefits the public. I would propose instead of abruptly retiring it in FY21 um, that we urge council to find a way to use later funds in the next two years um, for its intended purpose. And then if that remains to be completed, then we can go ahead and retire that line item in the budget. I would normally be supportive of that, but I think we made that recommendation in 2015. So uh, I, I just think we need to just go for the full gut punch at this point. Any other comments on this or other parts of we're calling this a memo, a brief? <laughs> Issue brief. Um, no, I, I think it was really good. I highlighted parts that um, I like. Um, yeah, it, it, which I can just share with Steve later. But all in all, I think it's great. Um, I shared my two cents about later. Um, yeah, and Steve, thank you, thank you, thank you for putting the time into this. Mayor Pro Tem. No, Steve, thank you very much for this. This makes a lot more sense for me. Um, uh, I like some of the information that you provided in here, at, especially the fact that you're now using the two months reserve 
We're not well. Our council now is used, or treating the two month reserve kind of like a de facto Tabor reserve in a sense. That we're no, we're we're using that as a minimum in a sense in order in terms of what we can spend up to. Um, so I thought that that was a very good point. I guess the one thing that I'm still trying to understand, and you kind of brought, um, alluded to it as well, was just the fact that when would we go? What would be that sliding scale? When would we spend more? And it does sound like you, you're saying in prosperous years, you would. Um, actually, no. So I think, I, actually, I am confused on that because you're, in, you're saying in lean years, you would use more of the reserves in order to keep services running as normal. Right. Uh, and does that mean in, pro, in when the city's doing really well, do we go back and start accumulating more or, you know, going past the two months reserve or something along those lines. Um, that would be one area where I still need to get a little bit of clarity. It does. Um, and that that recommendation, that specific recommendation is closer to the end of the report. So it might might not be as clear as it, it should be. But uh, the proposal was um, we uh, we ratchet and slide. And at a certain point, um, I think my proposal was four months reserves. We cap any further growth of uh, that un unrestricted fund balance by uh, saying that it can grow no more than 10% or 15% per year. And then beyond that, that money must go to uh, either the capital projects fund and be swept into that fund or uh, towards other general fund uses or purposes. Um, but the, the purpose is to keep the unrestricted fund balance from ballooning the way it has. Um, and the philosophy behind that is that this is money that has been, that I think I might have used the somewhat incendiary term, uh, involuntarily confiscated from citizens. It's tax dollars. Um, you know, this isn't money that we put in the city's donation box. This is money that we have to pay the city. And that money, the relationship is that that money should be serving a public benefit. And when we have an unrestricted fund balance that it has ballooned, and we still have unmet needs around the city, it's a sign that maybe we have not structured our budget effectively. Here, pretend is your hand up again. Yes, it is, but I see that Suzanne's hand is up as well. Oh, okay. Uh, so actually, uh, this is a good question. So I'm, I'm kind of curious, and Director Sabata, this may be more of a question for you unless this committee has the answer. But are we able to transfer dollars to the capital improvement fund or the PIP and let it sit there without actually allocating towards a project? Because what it sounds like, Steve, if we do go over, uh, if we are at that four month cap and there's an additional 10 or 15 percent that we can't, that past the cap, can we put that towards one of the other funds in order to obviously? Uh, earmarked towards some capital projects. And, and I'll also point out the alternative would be to increase services somehow. You hire that code enforcement officer that the city has been wanting for some time or, you know, you you buy another police officer or what have you. Would you like me to comment? Yeah. Um, so if I'm understanding your question correctly, I think there is so much unmet need that was presented in the capital improvement plan and prioritized projects. I'm not certain why the dollars would sit there. You know, it's, am I understanding your question correctly? You're right. And I can provide an example. If you like, so obviously the parks to me is a, is at least for my purposes, I, I feel that that's where a lot of our unassigned fund balance should go. But if we only have, you know, two hundred thousand dollars over the four months, and I really want to start. You know, that's not going to get us much for a park, but if we combine that with the next year's uh, budget, maybe that two hundred thousand would go a little bit further in a sense, right? So, you know, we met our needs in terms of capital projects for this budget, but let's hold that two hundred thousand dollars so we can apply it to next year's budget where we can do something bigger with the park. I guess that that's my sense. Uh, my take on it instead of just saying, well, we have 200,000, but let's go ahead and put it towards this item that may be a little bit lo lower in terms of priority, but we have 200,000, so let's go ahead and spend it on that. 
Mm -hmm. And that certainly is a possibility. And I think as um, the, the capital plans are being reviewed, that that could be discussed where a certain amount of a certain portion of the unassigned fund balance is, is discussed as being used in future years for just the example that you're stating. Yeah. You, you could do that. Um, yeah. That brings up a question for me. This is a monthly um, assessment. Is that correct, Steve, in, in your view, every month that whether it would be over or under, there would need to be a decision? So the report is aimed more towards the annual budgeting process. Uh, so, you know, we can see trends over the past couple of years um, in the chart. And, you know, there is 2020 and 2021 year to date data, but that data hasn't been audited or, or um, fully published as of now, to my knowledge. So I didn't, you know, 2020 is not ended. So <laughs> um, I didn't include that. Uh, so the most recent we have is 2019. Um, but the idea is that uh, based upon what happened in, in the prior year um, and the projections of the current year, the budgeting process would include uh, adoption of these limits. Um, if you look at Littleton's model, it, it resembles this, although it seems to be less structured. Uh, on an annual basis, Littleton has a range that they can meet. Um, I think it was uh, 8% to, uh, at, the, at the bottom. Um, that's similar to what I'm proposing here, except I, I didn't propose a, a top limit. So if we have you know 50 years of prosperity in Inglewood, we could end up with a year in the unreserved fund balance. But each year we would only be contributing a certain percent of what the surplus was at the end of the year to that fund balance. So that the money that we collect largely goes to serve uh, some sort of public benefit. That's the primary goal here. I see the $20 million or so that's currently sitting as going to waste uh, because it's not being used for a public benefit. Any other questions or comments? Sorry. Uh, I appreciate you working on it so hard, Steve. I, I apologize that I haven't had enough time to dig into it to comment really substantively. Thank you for doing it, and I'm looking forward to going through it. Uh, I appreciate it. Yeah, and like I said, you won't hurt my feelings if there's, uh, you know, if this loses a couple pages. Uh, sometimes I struggle with brevity. Uh, I erred on the side of over explaining um, as much as I could because I I didn't really feel like the message was well understood the last time we presented it. So I wanted to really kind of do a, a deeper dig here. So for next steps, we are preparing um, to present this for February for it to be done. Um, so we'll need to finalize in our meeting in January. I'm curious if anyone has any recommendations for kind of the next process. We might have some edits or some workshopping, some thoughts after we've had some time to absorb it more fully or read it a couple of times. Um, what's the best way and the appropriate way for us to submit feedback? Do we need to do that in a meeting or sh I know we've done some shared docs in the past. Does anyone have a preference? I think I think this is a good opportunity to use Google Docs, but I'll tell you, I mean, I read. I quickly read all 10 pages this afternoon and I didn't find a whole lot, so. Um, I, that's just me. I, I think this will be an easy round of um, review and finalizing it. But that's what I would propose is Google Doc and then just either finalize it via email or at our next meeting. But um, it, this is pretty great. Yeah. If, if uh, we'd like to dump it into a Google Doc and people make comments so that we can do that uh, after after we discuss in January. I'm happy to do 
line edits and any sort of, you know, things along those lines. That would yeah. be helpful. I think the only thing that's missing is your highlight here that says, Steve, that says insert calculated amount here. <laughs> <laughs> that's really the only glaring thing that stood out to me. One of the reasons why I left that out was because it is something that uh, does require a little research. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, analysis of how much growth has been allowed in the past and how much reduction could happen in a given year. So I intend to base that starting point on that, but I think it may end up just being the the baseline recommendation of the Government Financial Officers Association, which is 16.7%. Although we have a much larger amount in than that, and then the question becomes how much of that do we keep? Um, Joel, thank you so much for your offer to edit and your continual expertise in that area for this committee. I'm sure we will take you up on that. Um, Steve, I think also the Google Doc would be helpful because it sounds like you're going to want to revise the second half, especially maybe with some comments from there for Tim. And so um, then we can see it in real time and you're not emailing multiple. Right. <laughs> um, do you want to just share a link in that format when you have it? Uh, so everybody has a copy of this document and uh, it, whoever our resident expert on Google Docs is, which is very much not me, should uh, accept that duty. I am happy to do that. That's no problem. Um, OK, wonderful. Sorry, Chelsea, were there, uh, I'm trying to remember, were there problems with like us meeting on a Google Doc? Was that some sort of forum or some sort of public records thing? We discussed it last time for the report, and I remember Jenny saying that it was okay because we did it. I remember we had this question. Can you offer any update, Jenny? Refresh our um, memory. I think as long as you don't have, you're you're not, you can't have more than three people <laughs> meeting and working on the document at at one, any one time. Then that becomes a meeting. So if you log in and three other people are in the dock, you need to wait your turn. Correct. Bounce out. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> or, or, or tap out. Slim to none. <laughs> Great. Um, then let's commit to reading this. Um, I'll send out the link and maybe making any kind of thoughts or comments um, by a certain date so we can finalize in our next meeting. Let's see here. What about like January 5th? Is that then two weeks before our next meeting? That way we've got some time to sit with it and then Steve could have some time to absorb the comments and make any edits. Um, and then we could discuss and finalize in our January meeting. Great. All right, I'll send out that link and a January 5th uh, deadline. And I think that's everything on this item, unless anyone has anything else. Wonderful. All right, then we will move on to members' choice. Anyone have anything else to discuss? Can I jump in first with members' choice? Because I would like to talk about the um, finance director interviews on Thursday. Um, and I guess I was going to uh, ask my question of manager Lewis and then assistant manager Dodd and none of them are on the call. So I open this up to anyone who <laughs> knows about this process and wishes to answer my questions, but um, I don't want to step on any toes, break any boundaries. So um, as a community member who's invited to be on this panel, um, what is my role? Can I ask one question? Am I mostly listening? Um, Jenny, I don't know if you're the person who can answer that. I don't know, but I'm going to get you that information. I'll talk to our HR director. OK, um, Hanger, unless unless Maria, you know. So I was just uh, referring back to an email that I received from Rhonda this afternoon. Mm -hmm. which supplied the materials and also um, information re related to how it will flow. I was checking to see everyone that is participating. It it seems, Suzanne, that you may have received that. Do you have questions after um, receiving that or perhaps you haven't seen it yet because it came um, at 5 o'clock? 
To be fair, yeah, I saw it in my yeah. inbox. I saw the resumes because that was also something that I wanted to request and thankfully they arrived. So yes. you know what I'll do is I'll read through the email. Um, and based on what that tells me, and unless I'm advised otherwise, I will prepare one interview question. And if I'm invited to ask questions, I will that ask that question of all the candidates. Um, and otherwise, if I'm advised otherwise, then I will be quiet, listen, take in as much as I can, and then provide feedback when the time is right. Okay. I, I was trying to read it quickly, but if you have yeah. questions for us to pass along to Rhonda, or if you want to reach out to her directly, I think that would be, that would yeah. be fine. Okay, I agree. so Rhonda might be my point of Your contact. Your contact, yep. yeah. Okay. Absolutely, yeah, Rhonda like is the point of contact. Great, great. And thank you. We're going to miss you. I've enjoyed <laughs> working with you in this capacity. And Oh, thanks. And you know, it's funny because really Jenny is, is the one who coordinates and works with all of you. And I was happy to participate and support her effort with this uh, committee. I learned so much. So thank you all. It was a pleasure working for the city of Englewood and meeting all of you. And um, just uh, thank you for your patience as we work through a lot of these issues. And I really wish you all the best and wish the city the best as well. They've got a good group of people supporting the budget. So thank you for that. How much longer does the city have you? <laughs> through the end of the year. I'll turn in all my stuff December 30th, yeah. which feels really strange to say. We will be on the road three weeks from tomorrow back to Ohio. So yeah. Yeah. I know. I can't believe it myself. I'm trying not to get stressed out about it. <laughs> <laughs> and here we all echo Suzanne's comments and wish you and your family the best and um Thanks. excited for you to have the opportunity to be close to kid, kids and all that good stuff. Yep. <laughs> Thanks. If you have a chance, check out Denison's Big Red and make sure that uh, the volleyball team is winning and that's all I ask. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else for members choice? Okay. Thanks for a really productive meeting, everyone. I really appreciate it and I hope you all have a wonderful holiday. Yes. Merry Christmas, you guys, and happy new year. Thank you. Merry Christmas. Thank you. Good night. We're adjourned. Good night.